Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast produced in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, my own website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz or at Banking Day. For the most exclusive access to leading economists and business leaders from around the world, subscribe to Talking Business from my website, leongetler.com. I'm Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 36 in our series for 2024, and today's date is Friday, October the 4th. First, I'll be talking to Melrose Health Group CEO, Nathan Cheong. Nathan is a leading figure in Australia's complementary medicine sector and has just completed a revolutionary new directive for Melrose with the launch of Future Lab, creating Australia's first over-the-counter range of longevity supplements. And I'll be talking to AMP Capital Chief Economist Shane Oliver about the last profit reporting season and what it says about the economy. But first, let's talk to Nathan Cheong. Well, Nathan, tell us about uh, the longevity supplements from Future Lab. Yeah, we uh, we launched a range of longevity supplements about two months ago. Now we launched them exclusively with our one of our pharmacy partners, Chemist Warehouse, um, and across the rest of health food and online. I guess I saw a opportunity to elevate a product range that hasn't really been focused on in the Australian market. And as it happens, longevity is hot right now. So everyone's talking health span versus lifespan, which which ultimately means how you function and how you can basically do the things that you do today in the later years of your life so that you're not living with disease, you're not living with debilitation that you know, stops you from doing the things that you'd like to do. And that focus has really come about, I think came it came really up to fruition through COVID when people were listening to a lot of podcasts. There was some interesting in, uh, literature or, or rather scientific studies that came out of Harvard around certain molecules that can lengthen people's lives, supposedly. And and then there was a lot of chatter and 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 content that sort of came out. And we and people have really took hold of it because it's very interesting. I mean, obviously we've been, you know, through history, everyone's been looking for, um, you know, the fountain of youth and, and, and really science has brought us a long way. And now we understand, you know, through, through a lot of studies that have been done in this area, what are the, what are the real, I guess, pieces of things that we can do that will move the needle. And what we did was we formulated a product range around those, um, I guess, four drivers of disease and um and we've uh, yeah we were probably Australia's first brand to do that. Well, tell us about the product range itself. Yeah, sure. So the we formulated products around four separate areas and 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 those four areas are really the main drivers of disease that that you know affect people as they age and that's uh, cardiovascular disease, uh cancer, neurodegenerative disease. And metabolic health issues. So metabolic health is really the, or, or rather diseases of metabolic health are, are, are the, that underpins those three other areas and drives that disease, those disease states. So the products that we launched are around cellular um, longevity, which is really, uh, I guess, the cornerstone of, of how we age, which is our DNA replication. And we, we brought a product out called DNA Repair, or, or rather NAD+, Plus, which is about DNA repair. Um, and that's and that's a, centered around a bioavailable molecule called nicotinamide riboside, and that and and people may know that as NR, or they may know they may know a, a, a precursor of that called NMN, and that's really a, a molecule that's got a lot of attention over the course of the last you know five to seven years around its ability to improve lifespan um, and health span. Beyond that, we've also launched products um, pertaining to inflammation as a, an inflammation is a, is a, is a big factor when it comes to chronic disease. We've launched a product called uh, cellular health, which is around protection. It's around what we call improving cellular senescence, which is the clearing of dead cells out of our system and, and autophagy. Um, which is which is kind of the same thing around you know when our cells die, be able to clear them out of your body is a really important thing, and that actually can can assist with aspects of aging. We are addressing stress because um, stress is another big area of people's lives that that um, impact aging, and we're also looking at people's sleep. Um, so we've got a product for sleep as well. Sleep is is one of the one of the key pillars around aging. Muscle health, and and we know that as we age, 
our muscles start to, um, I guess, they, they catabolize for, for want of a better word, which means that we, we're affected by sarcopenia. So unless we're doing something very intentional about retaining our muscles as we age, we will lose them. So we've got a product out, which is a clinically trialed ingredient to support aging muscles. And then off the back of that, um, we've also launched uh, products that affect um, cognition. So our memory, and again, memory is, is another piece uh, of another important part of our aging process that that does tend to go as we as we get older, unless we're again, very intentional about retaining that. And, and there's a, and we've got a product that that speaks to that. And um, look, that that's really the hallmarks of it. We have another product, cardiovascular health product to support heart health and vascular health. And, and when we've got, and all of these products we've designed to be bioavailable. So we've, we've probably been, you know, over the course of the last 12 to 18 months, scouring the globe for the best ingredients, the most bioavailable ingredients to be able to bring them together in a form that um, really doesn't ha have any competition in, in the Australian market at this point in time. Um, we're very proud of it. And I think that we, we have something that we can then launch up as well. So whilst we've launched this range of 11 products, we also have another 10 to, to 15 on the drawing board that we, we, we intend to launch in the course over the course of the next 12 months. That's fascinating now <laughs> and important, but how, how do we obtain these products? Do we go to chemists? Or... Oh yeah. Okay. So um, look at the moment, as I, as I mentioned, um, we have, we have our, an exclusive uh, relationship in pharmacy with Chemist Warehouse. So Chemist Warehouse were, uh, you know, were, I guess had the foresight to, to really support us in our endeavor to launch this range. They, they also see the opportunity around health span and, and anchoring a product range with something that's just more, more meaningful than say, you know, taking vitamins and supplements for general wellness, or if you've got a gap in your diet, you take a supplement, it's, you know, we wanted to kind of move away from that and actually center a product range, you know, an evidence-based product range around real areas that, pe that afflict people and that are interesting to people. So pharmacy, health food stores, and online at this point in time. So to get them online, you'd go to Future Lab? You go to melrosefuturelab.com.au and, and you'll see the, the product range and there's a lot of information on, on the website around the products themselves, um, in addition to the clinical trials that support the ingredients that are in the products, which I think, are, again, very important. Well, for consumers, it's, you'd, also, you'd also look for the label Melrose Future Lab. Correct, correct. Yes. Oh, okay. That sounds that sounds all very very good. Now, uh, do you do anything with immune immuno systems? Um, immunity. Um, we have one product at the moment for immunity. It, we've just launched a, a a vitamin C, a liposomal vitamin C. Vitamin C is obviously the most clinically trialed vitamin for um, reducing viral load. Um, and we've brought that out in a liposomal capsule, which all that means is it it, it improves the the bioavailability of the ingredient as you ingest it. So you're more likely to get close to 100% uptake of that particular molecule um, through your digestive system. Um, and then obviously that can then pass through the cell wall because of the liposomal um, nature of the, of the uh, molecule. We, we do intend to launch a, a, a more of a comprehensive um, immune formula um, probably this time next year. Um, but at this point in time, immunity is, is you know, is more of a byproduct of, 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 I guess, poor health. So obviously, you know, if we have a strong immune system, then we're, um, and that sort of is the cornerstone of good health and, and a strong immune system comes from, you know, getting enough sleep, um, exercising, having the right, you know, having a really good diet, um, low inflammation, um, a really healthy digestive system, all of those things um, attribute um, and, and contribute, I should say, to, um, to good immunity. Which uh, people as they age have to be aware of. Absolutely, I mean, and this is this is another this is another important part of the whole health span piece. Look, we're we're very, um, I guess, unique in that we don't. I I am a as a as a qualified you know practitioner. I I think that the most important things about um, health span and, and lifespan is exercise. Number one, so exercise, a combination of um, strength training and cardiovascular training, and we need to be doing that at least, you know, five times a week. Now, that that seems like a lot, but really, when you break it down, you can kind of fit that into your day in a, in a in a in a uh, easily fashion if you make it intentional. 
The next part is around diet, ensuring that you have a, a diet that is predominantly whole foods and you take ultra processed foods out of your diet, you take seed oils out of your diet and you take sugar out of your diet and you and then you have a, 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 a I guess a, a high quality protein source that you're getting and you're retaining um, so you can retain your muscle mass. And then there's sleep and sleep's so important to get um, and because it impacts so many areas of your life. Reduction of stress and and also, obviously, um, you know, having strong, a strong community around you, you know, strong emotional connections with your family and friends and, and your, and your neighbors. They're the, that's the cornerstone from my perspective of, of health span. Now, when, now, if you can, if you can do those things, you're, you're doing, you're doing extremely well. And the supplements that we bring to market are, in my opinion, kind of the icing on the cake right? They're, they're, your, they're your, I guess, variables or levers, extra levers you can pull to optimize your health span. And I think that's, that's the message that I, that I want to, I want to get across. These aren't, this isn't a, a magic pill that's going to, you know, put 10 years on you. It is more around, you know, being, it's, it's a, it's a way to kind of think about aging and health span. And if you're taking these supplements, you're also thinking about the, uh, the, the, the base of the pyramid. Right. And hence the term supplements. Correct. Yes, that's right. Right. People lose sight of that. They think, oh, it's it's you know these magic pills. I'll do everything, and it's like, no, no, you have to you have to do the basics first. That's so important. Well, Nathan, it's been terrific talking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, my pleasure, Leon. Thank, Thank you. you. And now let's talk to AMP Capital Chief Economist Shane Oliver. Shane, what's your view of the last profit reporting season? Look, to be honest with you, it was okay, but it wasn't fantastic. Yeah, if you look at the numbers, we saw less results beating expectations than normal, but we also saw less results coming in worse than expected compared to normal. So it was a bit of a toss up there. I guess you know, there was a pickup in a number of companies reporting profits up on a year ago. There was also a slight increase in the number of companies reporting increases in dividends on a year ago, both of which are positive signs, but the moves were relatively cautious. And at the end of the day, profit numbers for the financial year as a whole, this of course was 2023-2024, came in slightly worse than initially expected with a fall of 4.3%. So profits were down and they were down slightly more than expected at the start of August before the results started to flow. And we also saw a slight downgrade to expectations for profit growth for this financial year. The market was looking for a 5.4% rise at the start of the reporting season. It's now showing a rise at around 4%. So overall, it was okay. It wasn't as bad as feared. Markets, I think, share market was prepared to look through it. That's why, you know, markets are, the Aussie markets uh, you know, have managed to push on to record highs, even though it's come back a bit in the last few days. But uh, the results were still fairly, fairly soft. And obviously, we do need to see a pickup in the economy and a pickup in profits this year to support the expectations embedded into the share market. I thought the profit reporting season was fairly patchy. There were some good results, but uh, there were some very disappointing results as well. Yeah, patchy is another way to put, to put it. Uh, yeah, some upside surprise in some consumer results. You know, JB Hi-Fi doing pretty well, but then other consumer companies not doing so well. So very patchy overall, messy. A lot of the weakness, a lot of the big falls in profits were concentrated in energy and to a lesser degree, the mining companies coming off very high prices for commodities a year or two ago in the aftermath of the Ukraine war, which is still continuing. But when that war first started, it was a surge in commodity prices, which has since settled down. But that obviously weighed on resources stocks. Uh, which when you look at the rest of the market, it wasn't too bad. Most sectors saw profits up, but even within sectors, it was fairly messy. And I think bottom line is that companies are still facing a fairly tough environment out there in terms of demand. Demand is pretty constrained. That's what we've seen in the economic growth numbers overall, where economic growth has slowed to a crawl. And of course, the companies were able to raise their prices initially, but that's becoming a little bit harder. Like, in fact, there's less corporate mentions of high inflation now than there was and there's more corporate mentions of laying off workers so overall mixed messy not fantastic 
bottom line is profits were down, but it, it probably wasn't as bad as some had feared. And that's why, uh, you know, and, and of course, you know, there's the hope of lower interest rates ahead, all of which is uh, providing some support to the share market, even though the profit results weren't so flash. Well, in terms of interest rates, the issue is that inflation is still proving to be sticky. They're expected to go down. They're heading in the right direction, but it's going to take some time. And the view, the consensus view among economists is the RBA won't cut interest rates until February, March next year. That's right. And, and indeed, that is our view. We're looking for a cut in February. We think that rates have peaked. The Reserve Bank is yeah, still uh, uh, nervous about inflation being too high. Uh, Trim mean, you know, we're seeing a fall in the headline inflation rates uh, on the back of lower energy prices as a result of government rebates and various other goodies from governments, particularly out of Queensland for transport fares. But the Reserve Bank regards that fall as transitory. And obviously when those uh, cost of living support measures come to an end as legislated, then inflation will bounce back to the underlying rate. So the Reserve Bank focuses more on underlying inflation and it still remains too high for its liking. So that's why the Reserve Bank is not yet sort of following other central banks in cutting interest rates. So I think they will get there. It's just that it's going to take a little bit longer in Australia. Probably, uh, as I mentioned, you know, no rate cut until around February. Could come earlier if we saw a sharp rise in unemployment or big fall in inflation or you know, collapse in financial markets. But uh, in the absence of those things, and so far we're not seeing them, then the most likely scenario is that rate cuts are early next year. We'll start early next year as demand continues to remain soft and inflation continues to come down. So we are heading in the right direction. We're getting closer to it, um, but, but we're not there just yet. Indeed, and but the issue too is that inflation generally is not expected to come down to the RBA's target band of 2 to 3% by about 2026. That's right. It's going to take a while. The Reserve Bank uh, doesn't necessarily have to see inflation in the target band uh, before cutting rates. Don't forget inflation in the U.S., is still above the Fed's 2% target, uh, and yet they're cutting. Uh, we've seen various other countries, Canada, uh, UK, Europe, where underlying measures of inflation um, are still above target. And in many cases, the actual inflation rates are, are still above target, and there's still concern in those countries with services inflation. But the reserve banks or the central banks in those countries have started to cut rates primarily on the basis that they have confidence that inflation will be soon back at target and that therefore you don't need to keep interest rates as high as they have been. You could start to remove some of the what they call the restrictiveness of monetary policy um, and therefore start cutting um, the target. And I think that's what we will see in the Reserve Bank. The, the Reserve Bank won't have to have inflation back at the target before it starts cutting rates. It could start cutting before then provided it has confidence that we are heading back to that target within a reasonable time frame. Right, okay. But the, the other issue too with the profit reporting season is that uh, you said you said the resources companies are contributing mainly to it uh, in a good way, but iron ore prices have come down and that's going to affect their profits. It will. You're going to see ongoing constraints on profits for the big miners have also seen the oil price come down from its recent highs, although it's still very volatile given what's happening in the Middle East. So, yes, there is still a, uh, you know, a, a rougher road ahead for our big miners. I suspect that the iron ore price will still remain elevated relative to what many, or at least the government's forecast. The government forecasts a, a price of $65 a tonne. We're currently around $90 a tonne. We could see some more downside, but I think we'll probably end up being remaining above the uh, government's budget forecast. But nevertheless, that does take away some of the strength from the big miners. And, of course, the Chinese economy is still struggling, despite numerous efforts by the Chinese authorities to simulate things, although I'd have to say they were, they've been half-hearted stimulus measures. Uh, the Chinese economy still remains quite weak. We've seen uh, recent data for the month of August. Things like retail sales, industrial production, investment all come in on the soft side in China. And, of course, that is leading to uh, or associated with weak demand for iron ore and, of course, weighing on the iron ore price to some degree. I suspect, though, that at some point the Chinese authorities will start to provide more stimulus. I don't expect a big bang like we saw at the time of the GFC. I think we're a long way away from those days. But I think at some point there will be some more stimulus. Right, OK. And the issue, too, is that uh, that would mean the government would be getting less revenue in tax. Yeah, the, 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 the reality is that the days of 
big upside surprises on government revenue flowing to Canberra as a result of commodity prices, particularly for iron ore, probably behind us. But the reality also is that we're still at levels that aren't that, that are above government spending term forecast for the iron ore price. The iron ore price currently uh, around ninety dollars. Government's assuming sixty five dollars over the medium term. So we're still above that. So there's still a bit of support there. But if the iron ore price keeps coming down, then then that support will become less and less. Uh, the other factor, which is, of course has been helping the budget, has been a strong labour market. The labour market in Australia is now slowing down. That means less uh, personal income tax collection. So. The odds are we are now going to slip back into a deficit for the federal budget after a couple of years of welcome surpluses. And I, I think the focus on the need to rein in government spending will only intensify from here. We are seeing very strong structural demands for spending in terms of defence, NDIS, health and so on. But obviously the government will at some point need to find ways to rein in government spending. And indeed, one of the factors in Australia, which has arguably kept inflation higher for longer, has been a very strong growth in government demand. Public spending growth seems to be running around 4%. We're seeing public spending, both state and federal, at record levels as a share of the economy. That is offsetting the, some of the weakness we're seeing in the private sector. In normal times, you'd say that's good, yeah. um, but it makes life a lot tougher for the Reserve Bank that's trying to get inflation down and wants to see cooler demand. I mean, of course, if there's very strong public demand growth, it means that private sector demand, consumers, households in particular, have to bear more of the pain. So, in other words, governments have actually made, made life tougher for the Reserve Bank and for Australian households. On the other hand, the latest growth figures, where Australia came in barely growing at 1%, that was supported by largely government spending. That's right. Government spending is, is the thing keeping the economy going. If we didn't have that, we'd probably, uh, would, along with the very strong population growth, we'd probably be in recession uh, because per capita spending, per person spending is slowing. So, yes, government spending is helping to support the economy, but it's meant higher interest rates for longer um, because the higher interest